well, I can uh, say a couple of words. Most of uh, you have already been here before, but uh, those who are here for the first time, we have this kind of a tech series where we decided to go through some technical details for admins and other people who are interested in how do we are doing things, how do we operate. And uh, you probably saw already the list, so this is something like fourth or fifth time we are having this and we have a chance in topics. And today we have a really interesting talk from uh, Simo Tuomista talking how do we, uh, we are doing uh, software deployment at the Alta side, but also to some extent this applies to whole FCCI via CVMFS. And Simo has been working at uh, uh, Alta Scientific Computing, that's basically our name, how we are we operating the operations at Alta for us for quite a long time, and it's really good expert in both GPU side and uh, nowadays has been putting lots of effort for the SPAC deployment strategies and how do we are getting uh, software fast and easily to the researchers. And now I'm giving stage to Simo to go through the details how we are operating these things today. Please, Simo, mm. go ahead. Yeah, thanks, Mikko. Yeah, so, so um, yeah, lots of, lots of words there. Uh, some of this stuff that I'm going to be presenting is is on the on the move, uh, very on the move because uh, in the in the winter we had a hardware failure uh, on the build system and we had to like start it up again and that was a good time to well evaluate what we have and and adapt them and uh, and now we are uh, rebuilding it uh, to be. Uh, even better so so a lot of this stuff is constantly on the move and constantly in the development but uh, it's still uh, like the, the same core is the same as in the old build system but yeah so what i'm going to be talking about today is is um, i made some few slides they're not complicated slides uh, i wanted to keep this as simple as possible but like how how we have software installations uh, done in Alto, uh, in the Alto scientific computing side, uh, with our CI build system. So, uh, in this talk, I'll try to explain. Simo, sorry to uh, interrupt. Uh, could you very briefly just go through how do you want to get the feedback and uh, how do you want this uh, hack MD to work? We are happy to answer, oh, yeah. but some people are probably not aware. Yeah. So, so yeah. If you're, if you go to the audience notes. Uh, over here in the question side, you can you can post whatever questions and you can answer them yourself, or you can uh, wait for me to like get to the end of the talk. I'll probably briefly look at the questions but during the talk. I probably can't can't multitask or won't multitask uh, them. So um, yeah, so uh, if you if you want to post any questions here put them like questions related to what I'm saying, like if I'm talking gibberish, or if you have like questions that you would like answered on your site and asking basically how other sites have like figured out these kind of problems. Uh, I will be uh, in my talk, I will be going through like from the problem solutions uh, point of view of this, uh, like how the build system came about, basically. So I think that is better way of describing the build system. And uh, if you, these might arouse some like uh, ideas, like basically like, okay, we have experienced this problem, how do you solve it? And uh, like, it might be a good idea to post it here and, and uh, let other people answer it or start a further discussion about like uh, how the CI system should operate. Um, but yeah, so so you can go here, uh, you can press the edit button, you will get this kind of a view where it's like, a, uh, you can either put it on only on the viewing mode, or you can like have this double view where you have the rendered one and here's the markdown code of the, uh, of the document. So you can edit it freely. Please post questions here. Okay, so yeah, about the presentation, like I said, I will try to go through like uh, like looking at the build system top down. It looks really complicated, but uh, I, I wanted in this talk to make it a bit simpler. Uh, so I will go from the bottom up and and uh, and basically describe how it came to pass 
because of like it's trying to solve these specific problems. So it's in a, in a sense, it's a really simple system built in a complicated system, but it's complicated because it's like an onion. So you have layers and layers on top of layers, and and in the inside, it's very simple. In the inside, it's basically tr running commands, but there's lots of onion layers on top of it. And if I start to peel it from the top, it looks really, it starts to look complicated, but there's more stuff coming constantly. But if you start from the center, it's it's much easier. So uh, what the goal was for the build system <clears throat> was to automate the boring work as much as possible without compromising the quality of the software that we built. So basically like, uh, once you have run these kind of installation commands, like X number of times, you get really, really uh, fed up with it. So we, we want to automate it and make it so that uh, like it removes as much as the human participation as possible so that you don't make mistakes and stuff like that. The current build system is about fifth iteration. So previous we, previously we used EaseBuild, we, we used Jenkins. Now we have switched to uh, SPAC and BuildBot. And so this current version has been in use for about two years, but it's constantly evolving. So, uh, well, it's a thesis ship basically that to, to you know where it begins and what was the original one. But basically the, it's very like the, the core layers, the core build rules are very, very like, we sometimes fix some bugs, but they have been in use for like two years. So uh, how, how, did this, how did this come to pass? So basically the step one was that we want to build some software. So it, uh, we use SPAC to compile software, and then we want to take, create Anaconda environments for users to run Python stuff. Uh, for, for that, we use Miniconda and Mamba. So this Mamba is a great tool. I highly, it's besides the topic, but I highly recommend you check it out. <clears throat> it makes the installation a lot faster, but we use those to create like Python environments for our users. Uh, and then we use Singularity build to build uh, containers for specialized software. Okay, how do we do this? Uh, let's look at the spec for the whole of the stuff here. I will only focus on the spec thing, but it's basically the similar kind of situation for the Conda thing and similarity thing. So when you want to install some software, you usually you download spec, you get it for yourself, and then you run spec install <coughs> some software. It's very simple. It's very good software, the spec uh, suite. Uh, so it's you just download it, you activate it, and then you run spec install the open MPI. But this immediately uh, when you try to make it into production uh, or take it into production, there's some problems. So basically, the greatest benefit and uh, compared to easy build and uh, like at the same time like a constant uh, pain in the ass is that spec finds uh, dependencies dynamically. So you have can have different dependency resolutions. So if you install, let's say, HDF5 with MPI uh, uh, parallelization, uh, it creates a different package than if you create an HDF5 without MPI parallelization. So you get like multiple versions of the same uh, same like version, multiple versions of the same package quite easily. And when you have multiple versions of the all kinds of packages, you end up in a situation where you have like huge bunch of packages and then it can becomes problematic for users. So we wanted to make it so that like the packages are, there's only like one open plus or something like that, or if there's two versions, it's it's clearly marked what what, what is the features of these versions. So um, uh, to how do, how do we solve this? So SPAC has these, uh, site configs that you can use to uh, specify some default versions of variants. So basically like, and, and also you can specify like module name uh, standards, how the module names, how they are formed, like what kind of module name structure you want. So these are very good. You can already like get much cleaner installation if you like say to it that, okay, for everything that requires a compiler, you use certain version of GCC or use certain version of OpenMPI. So you can set these providers. Okay, so what if you want to install the software with certain optimizations and certain compilers? Well, uh, you can specify like these compilers in spec, like use, for example, GCC, 
and you can specify the architecture where you want to build. So for us, the architecture now is Haswell. So that is the like uh, greatest common divisor of the system or like least, I don't know, the, the, the minimum uh, CPU architecture that we have. So, so we built for that. So it runs on all of the nodes. So um, you can specify these, but sometimes SPAC doesn't propagate these architecture optimization, optimization flags to builds. So, so there's some cases where it, it like there's some uh, mistakes in some package configurations and then it doesn't propagate all through and then you get code that gives seg faults on, on some nodes. Well, there is a solution for this. So you can specify uh, these compiler options uh, and default compilers in this uh, SPAC uh, Linux compilers YAML in your home folder of the user. Okay, so now you get like a consistent uh, architecture optimized software uh, suite. Okay, now repeat it 100 times. And this is where like you get, it gets really boring and really annoying. Like basically when you want to run a consistent installation of like a bunch of software, you need to run all of these kinds of uh, complicated commands one by one. And that's something that, uh, well, at least I don't find interesting in the, in this kind of job. So what um, you have to remember lots of like stuff. You have to remember to put the configurations to the right page. Uh, you have to have to make certain that, okay, what, what command did I run before? Did I, uh, did I run what, uh, what, what is happening? Uh, so we may, made these build rules so basically they are like kind of a script kind of a thing. They could be written in some other language, some other way, but, but in essence, they are that basically based on this like minimal configuration, like we have this build, uh, build config YAML. So basically we have this one YAML file that has like internal logic where uh, from there the build rules will create these spec install commands basically so you don't have to always specify the architecture the compiler and so forth the, uh, the, it will automatically fill the blanks basically based on this uh, yaml file so we just give it the yaml file and we say that okay here's the here's the package that we want to install and then we put a bunch of these packages we put maybe if we want to install a compiler we put it into a specific compiler section so so like it will know that to activate it as a compiler and then it basically runs the same commands all throughout and at the end it will uh, recreate the uh, recreate the modules to check that there's no like conflicting module names or something like that and then it will deploy it with rsync and, and then we put all of these configurations and, uh, and the SPAC side configs that we use to set the defaults, like the default routes that SPAC should take. And we put them into this signed build configs repository. So we have this one repository is basically like the verb on how to do it. And here is basically like what we want to be done. And then this is basically static. We don't if there's a bug we or if we want to change the installation logic in some sense we adapt this but most of the time we just update this second one and we don't care about the first one uh, so yeah so we just update the configuration what we want to be done we don't care about how it's done because that's already defined so it's basically like a you could write this in in make file or snake make or whatever but it, it has some additional features and those features are used for the other builds as well. So they're like class structures and stuff like that. So uh, the same kind of logic is used for the other builders as well. So it makes it a bit easier. Okay, but this is not CI yet. So, so this is not contigu contiguous integration. This is uh, like creating consistent builds. But now we want to do it automatically so that we don't, we don't have to do it. Like we don't want to run the build rules ourselves constantly. Uh, because there's, there can be problems with that. So why did we move to the direct direction we currently have? And so, so here's some things that happened. So first is ownership troubles. I think there's a hot microphone somewhere in the background. Uh, is it simple or I think you have a microphone open. You can hear talk, but, uh, yeah, so, um, uh, there was 
like previously we installed stuff with easy build and uh, and manually and stuff like that and there's always going to be a situation where the builder tries to do something and the files are owned by the other admin and then it fails because like it can't write to a folder it can't read a folder it can't do some modification it can't do something uh, so if admins run the commands there will be problems because well there's going to be uh, ownership like clashes uh, there so the problem is that the builds can fail and also like i personally like we previously when we run the easy build setup every everybody had basically their own like configurations that they have set at some point at their home folder and forgot about and then when they did the build nobody could get the same build because like uh, everybody had some like special settings set in their home folder and and this is something that might affect the build and of course this is not something that we want so we created a user that runs the build rules for us uh, so so for us, it's uh, this Triton CI user. So it's basically like a machine user that like nobody actually logins as, uh, yeah, except for like doing these builds. Okay, the builds can be heavy, so we don't want to run them on the login node. Like like some of these compiler builds, they can take like two hours, three hours, or something. And we we don't want to put the load to the cluster itself. So. Uh, there's also the problem that they can they can create a huge number of temper record files and they can use uh, quite a bit of mem memory. So the, it's better to run them on top of like an SSD drive somewhere. So the solution we run it on a separate machine. Uh, for us, it's simple like Dell workstation, like Power workstation, with a few SSDs and then hard disk for the eventual products for like saving the end products. So, okay, so now the build has been moved out of the system, but we still uh, want to build for our current environment. And maybe we want to run for the operating system like the uh, other operating system, like our workstations have. So it should be, the build environment should be as similar as the actual image that is running in the like OHPC image in, in Triton or the workstation that we have in, the, in our work, well, Ubuntu that we have in our workstations. So, so basically, uh, we move it into containers. So now we run the build rules in, in containers, in Docker containers, uh, so that uh, like the libraries and the mount points would be as similar as possible. So we run the build build uh, configurations in in these Docker uh, containers that are built uh, well to be as similar to the end end place as it. Uh, is as we want. So we currently have to build build places or targets we built on. So our Ubuntu twenty or four workstations, and then the cluster CentOS seven point nine, the Open HPC version. Uh, that it, they're like minimal images. They don't have anything in there except like compilers and and maybe some some stuff like that and and some uh, stuff to get the CI working. And we run as the user, the Triton CI user inside the images. Okay, but we still don't run this stuff automatically. Uh, we, we now have a, like a setup to run the, the different builds, but we don't do it automatically. So we should we want them to happen automatically when we update the configurations. So for this, we use the build bot. So build bot is like a Python framework. So it's similar to Jenkins, but it's Python. So it's actually easy to code compared to Jenkins, which is Java and XML. And uh, like, it was horrible. So uh, at least to me, uh, when we want to adapt the build system sometimes. So so we actually have a, have a build bot that basically runs the builds in the Docker containers. Uh, and it gets the information from the GitHub. So whenever we push stuff to, to Git, uh, we get a like a uh, like a hook. There's a hook in the um, in Git that sends a message to Buildbot to start the build, and it will pull the repositories and run the builds in the correct uh, builder. So it will choose the builder where it wants to run, and then it will based on the Git changes. So what files have changed, it will run those builders where the files have changed, uh, the configuration files have changed. And then uh, we want to put this all of this together so that we don't have to like manage the builder ourselves. So there's also a CI builder in the build rules itself. So the build rules can set up the builder that uses the build rules. So, so this is where it gets like uh, 
you get this uh, self-eating snake kind of a situation where it gets quite complicated to, maybe to visualize. But so basically we have a builder that can set up this, uh, this CI system. And the end product is basically like a, do like a folder with a Docker Compose file that we say that, okay, get this system running and then it will run uh, uh, run the system basically. Uh, so, so there's this like a, there's this server then running. Okay, this this has been a lot of lot of stuff here. So I'll demo it quickly. Uh, I'll I'll try to this uh, demo how we install packages. Uh, I'll stop the share and I'll take the whole desktop so that it's easier to show. Okay, so you can see probably my desktop. So let's go to, oh, actually I can't do it here, just a second. Uh, I don't have the correct proxy enabled there. But just a second, get me another window. Yeah, I have to proxy the connection. So, so we go to Ski Builder, so this is the server. So this is basically a workstation uh, that runs the build bot, and there's an uh, Nginx on like at the front to uh, give access to the build bot. And over here we have um, we can see the like the status. So twenty recent builds. So recently there's been some Anaconda builds and some spec builds, and uh, we see a list here. And then we can look at the builders. For example, I see that there's like different builders. So some of the old builders, for example, what Miko mentioned about the CVMFS builder, that's not currently operational because of the hardware failure, but I'm, I'm in, in the process of bringing them up uh, myself. But okay, let's let's look at like what, what would we want to do if we want to install a package. So what we have here uh, on the left side are the uh, science build configurations. So this is this repo is in the uh, in uh, GitHub over here, and there's this configs folder. And for these configs, there are well some some builders are still work in progress, but they are like build configurations for different builders. So for example, we have these pack builders and then we have these Anaconda builders. Uh, there's um, over here, for example, in the uh, dev branch, we have uh, like the site configurations. So these config YAML, module YAML and package YAML, they're basically packets, uh, specs, like site configurations. This is like how it should deploy the stuff with the, the in our case, we use rsync. And over here, it's uh, like the main configuration. So this main configuration looks like this. So this is this is what the build rules reads it. So this is the target architecture that it will try to force for every package. Here we have some compilers specified. Some of them are system compilers. Most of them are, are installed compilers. We can specify some extra flags for the compilers. So here we force the basically to, <laughs> to make the uh, compiler for the Haswell architecture. And then we have a list of packages that we want to install. So let's try uh, installing a new package here. So I have spec on my system, I have spec enabled here. So let's say we want to install a new version of Emacs. So I run spec info Emacs. I see that there's a new version here, 27.1. Uh, and we want to install that. So I open, uh, this is my local copy of the repository. Mm. I open here, spec build config here, open the folds, go to the end, copy the two lines, put here, Emacs. I, uh, Sorry about the coloring of the font, if you can't see, but it basically says Emacs 27.1. Uh, and then I see that I have changed the file. I 
basically added these two lines. And what I do, so so we have this kind of a structure where we have two dev build, uh, dev build, and then we have the core like the final build. So usually we just push stuff to the dev build, but when it comes to when we want to join. Uh, put them into the official build that the users see, uh, we made a pull request and then some other admin can click it through to set, check that I, it's uh, like uh, correctly, uh, correctly <laughs> installs the package and it looks, it's, it's tested and it looks good. So here I mentioned that uh, I'm testing Emacs. Uh, so this is spec versioning kind of scheme. So that's sign. I'm testing Emacs, I run git push, These files should here change. Maybe it doesn't change. Uh, yeah, you see that there's like the emax is added here. And now if we go to the build, well, build uh, the ski builder, we see that there's a build started. So we'll look into it and it gives a lot of output here. <laughs> so so what it does basically, it syncs the, syncs the configurations over here and then it tries to tell us what it, what it will do. So this describe step, uh, the conf it can be a bit hard to read because there's a lots of uh, lots of stuff here. But what what in essence what it does is that it basically runs. We focus on one of these commands. For example, this last one, spec uh, config scope. So this might be a bit the font might be a bit small. I'll make it. So what it does here is it runs spec config scope and then it gives the path to the configuration file install verbose emacs and put the architecture there. And so basically it runs these like spec install commands. It just runs them, but, but it basically feels all of the rest of the crap that you don't have to remember. So it feels the automatically the architecture, it uses the correct configuration it starts from basically scratch and it will it will run it after it has run the rest of the commands so that there's bound to be less uh, less problems with the rest of the software and over here in the other section we see that it's actually running the commands it will take a minute to run uh, run the stuff but basically uh, here is here is it, it is running uh, so, so this is how we basically do the build. So, so if this fails, of course, then in that case, we need to usually go to the image itself to figure out, or the server itself to figure out what's the problem. And we can go there in the, so here is the ski builder. We can go there and we can run this uh, worker shell and we get into the image. And over here, we can like, we run our own commands or we can uninstall the failed packages and whatever like spec. Uh, there's some uh, not not so pretty things that, for example, you need to run this spec builder alias instead of this spec uh, command. But basically you can see there that the end product is, well, lots of software that we have. Uh, and then this software is copied uh, to the uh, to our systems, and then we test it out. Uh, we run some test like examples on it, and then we, uh, if it works, then we put it into the generic branch, and then we ship it. So this this doesn't like absolve the admins of like if the build fails, you can't just like it doesn't solve the problems for you. It doesn't like figure out how to get the build working. If it fails, it fails, but it's it's better that it fail like. Uh, harshly on, on and not like uh, not this kind of a, like a sudden like a, a unsuspecting way on the background and then you don't know what went wrong and 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 then the people get some software that doesn't work or something like that so it's better that it, it just fails and says to you that okay like i i crap my pants please clean up okay so uh yeah, while we're waiting for this to finish, maybe I'll um, maybe maybe I'll uh, mention uh, a few problems with the system that we currently have. Yeah, because I I want to be honest with the system, it's not perfect. 
So, so the deployment of the CI is not good. <laughs> like that's something that we're working on with Simpa currently. So, so basically, uh, there's lots of like hidden dependencies that you need from the systems. You need to have Docker installed. You need to have Docker Compose installed. You need to create like these some folders to to set up the build environment. And that's not something that uh, that is actually. So, by the way, now it's actually running the build. So now you see that there's some uh, C configure. Uh, output coming here so so it went through the previous like checks and then it like continues but yeah so so the ci build isn't good so we are with simpa we are trying to figure it out so that we can translate the ci builder that we currently have into into an simple role that would set up the build system so that would be much uh, better so that then you could run it on any system and it, it would be easier to deploy for other sites and for everybody else and for us as well um, sometimes, and the other uh, pro problem with spec build specifically is that uh, sometimes you get these build avalanches. So we run from uh, our own fork of of uh, spec uh, with uh, with like yeah own fork of spec, and and that's because like the upstream updates so constantly that if if some dependency is updated, it will cause cause this build avalanche where it basically like plows through the whole system. So like if being util, so something updates, then tries to compile a new compiler, then it tries to compile the next software and so forth. And then you end up with a completely new software stack. So what we currently do is we just remove basically everything uh, that conflicts and we just reinstall it uh, after after we have done like sync with the upstream. But um, in the future, we probably will try to have this kind of a two-step a process where we build like this more uh, stable like uh, base operating system like base build that has like certain libraries that are like set to in stone and then the, we have another builder that is moving faster and uh, will will build these end products using the other like slower build but this is something that we'll have to check in the future uh, other problem is that the science build rules is a bit scripty and, and its structure is not probably very clear. Uh, so, so it might be easier, it could be uh, better, it could be written in, in a better way so that it's easier to read and what's the like build logic, uh, how does it go, go about, about doing the stuff it does. So that could be, uh, that could be updated on and, and made better, uh, so uh, so that the it, it, it's easier to easier to take into uh, well easier to read and easier to understand what it does. And I, I'm not certain if the build configuration is uh, like helpful or not because uh, it it can be hard to. At the same time, it's nice that it fills all the blanks, but sometimes it can. Um, like uh, yeah, it can it can hide the details, and then uh, you don't necessarily know how it relates to the spec underneath it. And and uh, the uh, because it's constantly moving, and there's lots of moving parts. Documentation is of course in these kinds of projects is not up to date. So that's something that uh, really needs to be improved. And uh, and we're like we have now much more people using the system previously it was basically me who was running stuff through it but now we have multiple of our admins running through uh, builds through it so we get constant feedback on what's what's bad about the documentation and then we're updating it so okay the build finished so what it what it does here basically um update the, I put this full screen unless zoom doesn't want me to yeah so what it did here, so there's some 1500 lines. So it run uh, through the previous installations, lots of them. It, it checks that all of the dev, like packages are installed. And over here, it starts a new build. So you can see here that it runs this line. So over here, it runs spec install emax. It's quite small, sorry about the font. But basically, it runs back install Emax, then it goes through here, and then it says that it's installing Emax, and then it basically runs this back build, runs through it. Uh, lots of make 
stuff. And at, at the end, it, uh, it R-syncs the stuff. So here it prints what it R-syncs to, to, uh, to a cluster. And then we can go to, to our cluster. And we have this separate module uh, path that we can activate uh, to see that. Uh, oh, I activated the uh, Anaconda. Uh, yeah, so this, oops. Yes, this path. So you see it's the FGC send us 7 as well dev. We activate this. Previously, we had Emax 26.2. In this branch, um, hopefully, we have Emax, two versions of Emax now. Yeah, so we have two versions here. So now we have this. I can show that it, it comes from the dev branch. So over here, it comes from the dev branch. I'll load it. Yeah, and now I'll have to kill the window because I don't know how to exit Emax. Yeah. So yeah, that's that's about it. Uh, do you have any questions? Do you want to ask uh, by words, or should I look at the what's here? Okay, that's a good question. Uh, how to install soft, how to handle software that is not in spec? So there's few options like oops. Uh, like like mentioned here that you can you can mount you can install of course software outside of it like we installed MATLAB and Mathematica and stuff like that that has like some installer we install outside of it but also we we also write new spec uh, packages they are not very hard to write so so basically uh, well Marain can can probably <laughs> tell you what was it hard to write like he, he wrote one of these packages like this MDS plus uh, no it was not no it was not hard to write at all. It's mm. just another built like built system thing to learn, basically. So, yeah. but it's it's spec is very well documented. So if you spend mm. a little time reading the manual, then yeah, like and and of course yeah. looking at also the benefit of that everything is in this repo, so that you can very quickly find uh, a similar package and just look at how the spec file was mm. written for that package, and then you can yeah based so, on that. So for example, yeah, if you have an example like this, I think you can quickly mm. base your own thing. Yeah, so this. so this was written by Mara. And did you did you make a PR to the official upstream yet? Yeah, I okay. did. Um, but I haven't checked up on it lately. Mm. I think it went yeah. to mostly ignored, actually. Okay. It is hard. Well, I, I guess they uh, at some point will look into it. But but yeah, basically you you specify some versions and some dependencies and maybe some variants, and then you specify like how these uh configuration structures are going there and it supports most of the basic like auto tools and c makes and st stuff like that and it has all kinds of helper functions so it's really easy to uh do and then like the anaconda stuff and uh, that stuff is, is basically like they say similar kind of stuff uh we have the build configuration and then it runs like similar kind of commands but it runs conda commands and it sanitizes the environment so that the conda environment is not uh, bad but that's a, another story uh, yeah time scale of these steps yeah i'd say that Yeah, we previously had a singularity builder as well. It 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 was working and it it was pushing stuff to Puhti and uh, also and 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 uh, workstations. But then, well, the recent problem can create. Yeah, we we're trying to take the CDM stuff back into action. Yes, that's also uh, like yeah, at the same time, like the pro like currently we're at the pr problem where. We are there are actually highest priorities get rid of like the old software <laughs> like because like we have so much of this legacy software lying around because we are like constantly like the, this thesis ship kind of system so we have lots of software so we are currently creating automations to deprecate our software because like no human wants to like write that 
files to deprecate the software. Or, so we are creating automations based on usage statistics to remove this, but it's, it's another story. But but yeah, like we, we're trying to get as much, uh, much of these features back online. So. Yeah, so so how do you know when the software is updated? Well, normally we ask the users, a lot of the users will ask us and then we'll update the, the version. Our, uh, our, basically our goal is to make it so that it, like EasyBuild has this, like this kind of a, uh, like uh, releases. So it has these releases like every half a year, they build the whole software stack again with the, uh, with the most recent software, but it's not fast enough for our users in practice. Like in, in practice, it wasn't like, like there was constantly like when we previously used these, it was constantly like this kind of a fiddling around with the, with the version numbers, because some user wanted some new version, then you get like a million versions of the same software. And we still are reaping, well, benef benefits of that situation because we have like million versions of different software installed via EasyBuild. So uh, that's not, uh, now we have only like, hopefully only few versions with this back installation. Yeah. But uh, so so and if you're interested about this, like like hit me up so that like we can get other people running this as well or getting the software to their systems and uh, like like I really want to provide them via the CBMFs, but it's like there's a lot of uh, but you usually end up so that once you have finished with the tool, you start to use the tool immediately and and. Uh, that can create a situation where you uh, we you can't uh, continue working on the tool itself. So at some point, you need to get finished products for the users, especially if they have issues and stuff like that. So uh, the the development of the the build uh, system it has been quite of like a this kind of a uh, only when when it's been forced by outside uh, outside requests. But if there's nothing else, then hopefully this was um, this described. But, but I would say, like, what what to take from like this talk is that you can use uh, the same tools as we we use. We find them somewhat good uh, in practice. Uh, but I would uh, recommend checking some of these problems that I try to uh, outline here. Like if you are if you are going to build your own system, like on top of like I don't know Snake Mega or something like that, would be something that I would probably do now if I would start from scratch. If you're going to be starting from there, I would highly recommend looking at these same problems and uh, and uh, then uh, well uh, trying to uh, trying to figure out how to. Uh, uh, how to how to fix them with your system as well, or how you, however you want to do them, because these are something that uh, we encountered along the way, and they were the main problems that we tried to solve to, with this system. I'll I'll put a link to the uh, presentation, and I push it to the push it to the uh, web page, and I'll put a link in in the chat. Simo. Yeah. Simo, can I highlight also, also the question of the compiling with different compilers, like for instance, not only GCC, but also the Intel, how would you with mm. them? Mm. Okay, I'll actually resume my share. Okay, so yeah, so in the configuration, what we currently have, Um, if we look at here, for example, this uh, dev branch. So here we have specified um, compilers and we have also specified Intel compiler, so Intel Parallel Studio. So if you want to build with Intel, I wonder if there's the current iteration, if there's any software built with Intel. Um, Nope, no, there's no software built with Intel, uh, but we can, 
we can build stuff we need. Let, let's let's for the for the sake of argument, let's let's build the same um, same Emacs, but with Intel. So we copy paste this basically the same thing, but here we add. Uh, uh, there's a few of these like internal uh, like uh, groups here. So there's variants for sp specifying different variants, but there's different dependencies and stuff like that. Let's put into dependencies here Intel Parallel Studio. What was the version that we had? So let's put it here. Yeah, so now we are adding this one line over here. So we want to build with Intel Packard Studio. Um, and then uh, I'll push it and it should work, start building with the Intel compiler. So let's see, I have to take the other window. But yes, yeah, so, so basically it's, it's the same kind of stuff. You, if you want to build the, with the Intel compiler, you just specify that build with the Intel and that's about it. Like uh, you like you <clears throat> specify over here that uh, like at the start of the start of the configuration, you specify, so, so SPAC deals compilers as separately as, as like installed packages. So like normal packages, they are like software that are somewhere in the development pre or the deploy, like the DAG of the, all of the uh, dependencies, the dependency uh, like tree, but the compilers are special in that case that they can build stuff. So we have to first like install the compilers. So in our case, we install compilers using the system compiler, and then we use those to install the rest of the stuff. So you have to specify them before you uh, run any other packages. So, but the Intel compiler is, is similar to the other one. There's one uh, extra step with the Intel compilers that we need a license there. And we have, there's this license repo that we have that it basically, like I, I skipped some of the parts here, but it, it, it basically, uh, copies these licenses from our internal uh, repository. So this is not in GitHub. It, it copies the license repo uh, so that the internal licenses get to the right place. So there's some of these like uh, extra extra steps with the Intel compilers and Intel stuff, but it's, it's possible, but you have to like do a little bit of like scripting on the, on the side to fix it. Any other questions? There was also a question on the hack and be about the uh, software updates. Uh, oh, you mean like when when software is updated? Yeah, that's a kind of best practices for the updates. Mm. Yeah. So. Uh, yeah. So, um, is there a way to update or? Uh, yeah, so basically uh, what you can do, well, there they is not like, like because we, we only specify like the, the end products that we have uh, or we need. So there's no like really an option to update all because we need to always specify the, the what is the version that we have, we want the latest version. Of course, there could be some, some version where it would define like the, it would try to ask from spec, like what, what versions do you know about? But, but in, in a sense, like how we have done it currently is that we basically, we update the spec and then if the spec comes with a newer version that we want, we install it. But usually the problem is the other way around. The spec comes with newer versions that we don't really care about. So like nobody cares if the auto tools is, is low, like, I don't know, like libc, well, libc might actually need a newer version, but uh, like, I don't know, like, uh, like nobody cares if 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 C, C make is three point 
20.4 or 3.20.5 like there's some minor changes there and and maybe in a really special case you actually need to change but most of the time you end up in a situation where you get like some newer software that you don't actually need like like you want to keep the base layer as stable as possible and the bigger problem that we are trying to fix is that you get these software avalanches where like something updates in the bottom and you, it propagates through the whole whole three so usually we just uh, okay i might have I messed up the configuration uh <laughs> yeah it, it might have been intel i can't now remember but you specify the intel compiler well this may and be I true for the for the things you built with aspect that's right but the mm. cool thing about this build system is that it can also build anaconda environments and there mm. you're dealing with user facing python packages um and actually i had that in mind when i when i asked the question um uh, specifically mm. of course the neural imaging environment so oh yeah, yeah things like numpy yeah. and scipy and things you generally mm. want them at yeah. the latest so, version so yeah so okay so in that that's a different case so because Anaconda is is like it's even it's even worse than uh, SPAC when it comes to like the oh, yeah. uh, oh. in that sense that like it will always like you will never get the same environment basically unless you force the same build versions. So what we do with the Anaconda is is basically that we have uh, we have a version we have some. Uh, list of packages here a huge list of packages that we want to want in the environment and then we we say to say to the bit so basically this is internal logic for the anaconda builder but you specify a list of packages uh, that you want for the builder and then you build the environment and after that it will only build like differences so it will always keep the previously installed versions the same and it will only build on top of it like new packages so it doesn't like it doesn't uh, update like something in the background and in in there we work in this kind of uh, well like version kind of way so we have a previous version usually so here's uh, our first of the year version 2021 01 tf2 and some at some point we freeze the version so we say that okay don't update this version anymore and then we create the same version uh but with the same like start start with the, all of the rest of all of like start from scratch and build from like the newest versions so and then we iterate on top of that like new requests and then once the new requests are well like well, while we want when we when we want to update the whole damn thing we are again update the whole damn thing because with Ana anaconda is even worse like when you install a new package if you forgot to specify like some channel or something it can't like start swapping like from conda forge and defaults it will start like swapping packages like numpy previously came from there and now it comes from there and it's, it's a whole mess so that's why we want to keep it like we install everything at the same time and then we install few packages on top of it and then we install everything at the same time and uh but it's, it's a different story i can i can give another talk at the anaconda builder and problems with anaconda environments in general later on but basically yeah the, the anaconda builder is similar to the other builder so it has this build, build config with its internal structure there was a good question here. How how other FTC sites could participate right now? So so uh, I'll probably have to hang around in this in the Slack channel a bit more. But but uh, hopefully before the summer, I I can get the or we can get the CVMFS running again. So so like like in in the month or two. Uh, but uh, once we get it running, it would be nice if you want to test the software out and see what's, if it works for you. And, and uh, like we will first create a dev branch or something like that so that you don't have to, like, your users don't have to. Uh, uh, or we create a branch there and you don't have to activate it via modeler path to your users yet. But uh, so if you want to test it out, that's one way. And if you feel like you want to set, set up a similar kind of builder for yourself then ask us uh, once we get the ansible role done but that's is that is probably taking going to take a few months but once we get the ansible role done then you could also test that out to check uh, whether you can specify like create a build system of your own uh, and whether you 
fees like that that would work yeah uh, yeah sorry it's uh, it's complicated to uh like we ha we have this in use and we constantly like iterate on it but it um uh, it's it's sometimes with these projects it's really hard to open them up uh not because we want to keep it closed but because like you end up staring at that so long that you forget to write it in a way that other people can look at it as well so uh but like if you feel like building it with the current setup feel free or if you just want to look at the build rules themselves that's one way of working on it yeah if yeah but once we get the the cvmfs rolling again uh you can test the build like the build software and once we get the answer by roller rolling, you can test your own build system probably easier than currently. Yeah, this is going over time, but any any other question? If not, then I'll leave, give the floor. I'll I'll put the link to the presentation if you want to look at it. Uh, in a second.